Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about angular motion. Uh, so a lot of what we talk about here is going to be almost identical or extremely similar to what we discussed in linear motion. So the concepts are really almost all the same. Um, so once you understand linear motion, you're really just putting the word angular in front of just about everything we're going to talk about here. But it's all basically the same stuff. Uh, so angular motion, we also refer to as rotation. Um, so it's when a segment moves in a circular path around a fixed axis. Okay, so the axis remains the same, and then the segment is moving around that axis of rotation in a circular path, so that's rotation. Uh, so most motions in the human body involve rotation of bones at articulations. So like, even though we call this flexion and extension and abduction and adduction, what's still occurring from a biomechanical perspective is rotation of the humerus around the glenoid fossa. Okay, so we don't refer to that as rotation when we're talking about, um, like when we're naming joint actions, we name them appropriately, you know, flexion, extension, and so on. Um, but in terms of angular motion, that's rotation or angular motion that's happening in that joint. So a centric and an eccentric force, uh, not to be confused with muscle actions. Okay, so eccentric muscle contraction is different from an eccentric force. Okay, so those are the same word used in two different contexts to mean two different things. So make sure you have that straight in your thinking. Okay, so a centric force is a force that's applied directly through the center of mass of an object. So when we apply a force through the center of mass, it will cause linear movement of that object. So like if I have a big box and I'm trying to push it, I'm sliding it on the floor. If I push right through its center of mass, it won't have any amount of rotation and it will instead just, it will have linear motion. It'll just move in a straight line in the direction that I'm applying the force. An eccentric force is an off-center force, meaning away from center. So like if I pushed on the box, but now I'm kind of shifted off to one side, I'm not through its center of mass, I'm pushing on one side of the box. Um, now there will be some amount of linear motion, there'll be some amount of translation in the direction that I'm applying the force, but because I'm applying it in an off-center way, away from the center of mass, it's also gonna cause some amount of rotation of the box as it pushes forward. Okay, so um, an eccentric force may cause translation, but with some degree of rotation, depending on the distance from the center of mass. So the closer I am to the center of mass, the more linear motion we'll have and the less rotation. The further I get away from the center of mass, the more rotation we'll have and the less translation. Torque is the tendency of an eccentric force to cause angular motion of an object. Okay, so torque is not the same thing as force. The force is pushing and moving the object and the torque is the tendency of that force to cause angular motion. So a force might not cause any angular motion or it might cause a lot of angular motion torque is the tendency of that force to cause angular motion, or it's sort of the amount of angular motion that the force causes. All right, so displacement, velocity, and acceleration, we define exactly the same way as we do in linear motion. So in angular motion, same exact thing for displacement, velocity, and acceleration. But there are two differences that we do need to consider in angular motion. First is that there's an axis of rotation in angular motion. So in linear motion, there's no axis of rotation. The whole thing that we're describing is moving forward all at once. There's no axis. Um, in angular motion, the axis is where the thing is anchored, and then the rotation is happening around that axis. And then the second is that because the movement is happening in a circular path, we have to consider how many rotations that thing has had. Um, so like here I give you a picture of a tether ball. So, you know, if, if the ball goes from one position, it goes all the way around the circle and ends in the same position, 
um, we had a certain amount of distance traveled. But what if it goes around five times and ends in the same position? Then there's five times as much distance traveled. So we don't have that issue in linear motion uh, because we're not, we don't have to count the number of rotations because it's not rotating. Okay, so angular position. To determine the angular kinematics of a system, the initial position must first be identified. Okay, so we have to, you know, set our context. We have to, um, you know, define what our initial position is. Uh, the origin of our polar coordinates is what we'll use here. The origin is the axis of rotation of the thing that we're analyzing or the thing that we're defining. Uh, the radius and angle of our polar coordinates are used to identify the angular position, uh, which is the location of a point. Um, usually we're talking about the end of the segment, but it doesn't have to be, based on the origin, the radius, and theta. So we'll talk about all of those. All right, so the angular displacement is a change in angular position of the rotating segment. Okay, so if we look at our picture here, the radius, that's really the rotating segment that we're talking about, and we're talking about it moving through space. So it's pinned at the origin, it's, the origin is not moving, and then it's rotating around the origin. The radius of rotation, that's R, is the distance between the axis of rotation and a point on the rotating segment. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the very end of the segment. It could be at any point on the segment where we want to define and, and track its movement. So like I could be looking at my, from my elbow to the tips of my fingers could be the whole segment that I'm defining as I flex and extend my elbow. But I might want to be looking at this point at my wrist, not necessarily the very tips of my fingers. Okay, so my point is just that the radius could be to from the origin to any point on the segment that we define depending on what it is that we're studying. Um, so the radius of rotation determines the curvilinear displacement, which is the length of the arc that is created as that uh, rotation is happening. So in this picture, um, the curvilinear displacement, that is S with our two red arrows showing from the first position to the second position. Okay, so the curvilinear displacement depends not only on the angle, that change, the change of the angle, but it also depends on the location of the point on the segment. So like, let's say, you know, we're looking at this picture here and we have that change in theta. Theta is the difference from where we were at um, the x-axis up to the next position, that's our change in theta. But the curvilinear displacement or the length of the arc that is formed is different depending on what point on the segment that we're looking at. Okay, so there's a certain distance between the two positions that we see here, but what if we wanted to look at a point on the segment that was closer to the origin or closer to the axis of rotation than what we're defining and showing by this blue circle. What if the, so what I'm saying is, what if the change in theta remains the same, but the radius is half as long, like I'm analyzing my wrist compared to the tips of my fingers. That is going to change the curvilinear displacement because the length of the arc will be shorter if we're defining it or if we're measuring um, the curvilinear displacement at a more proximal, point instead of the more distal point. The linear displacement of a point on the rotating segment is found with this equation, which would be the change in theta times the radius. So if we just multiply the two, the change in theta, so like from zero to 70 degrees or whatever it is like in this picture, um, so that would be a change in theta would be 70 in that scenario and then multiply that by R. So the distance from the origin um, to whatever the point on the segment is that we're measuring. So maybe it's the very end of the segment or whatever other point in between that we might define. And that's the linear displacement of that point, whatever that point is that we're defining. Okay, so angular speed is exactly like linear speed. It's calculated exactly the same way, but using angular terms. 
Um, so we just take the angular distance traveled and divide that by the time interval that elapsed, exactly the same way as with linear motion. Angular velocity, same thing. Um, we're just taking the change in theta, um, so the change in position, and dividing that by the time that elapsed. Um, just like with linear motion, we also can find the peak rate of motion, the instantaneous speed, and the instantaneous velocity. Um, so exactly the same as with linear motion, but in this case, it's just angular because we're rotating instead of translating. Okay, angular acceleration. Again, exactly the same as with linear motion, but using angular terms. Uh, so it's a change in magnitude or direction of angular velocity. And so we just take that change of velocity and divide it by the change in time over which that change in velocity is happening, and that's the angular acceleration. Just like with linear motion, uh, we calculate it as an average for the motion, um, even though the acceleration might be fluctuating over the length of time that the acceleration is occurring. Uh, but we're just saying, here's how much acceleration occurred over this much time. So we really calculate it as an average, unless we want to find the instantaneous angular acceleration. Uh, so the angular acceleration at a given moment in time. Okay, uh, rotational or angular inertia. Uh, so we know inertia is the resistance to a change in state of rest or motion. Uh, so rotational inertia is the resistance of an object to a change in the state of its angular motion. Uh, so the distribution of mass of the object or of the system um, is really important when it comes to rotational inertia. So something that has greater mass has greater inertia, whether that's angular or not, um, or rotational or not. So a greater mass is going to mean a greater resistance to its change in motion, including rotational inertia. Um, when it comes to rotational inertia, it's also very important how far the center of mass of that thing is from the axis of rotation. So the closer the center of mass is, or the closer mass of the object is to the um, axis of rotation, the less rotational inertia there will be. So the less resistance there is to rotation and vice versa. Okay, so the angular acceleration is directly proportional to the net torque applied to an object. So the force and its tendency to cause rotation around the axis. So the more torque is applied to an object, the more change in its velocity or angular acceleration there will be. It's also inversely proportional to the rotational inertia. So more rotational inertia is going to mean less acceleration. It's going to mean less change in velocity. Okay, so more mass of the object or the mass is further from the axis of rotation is going to mean that there is less acceleration in response to an applied torque. Uh, so back to what we've talked about before, where our limbs taper, so we have more mass more proximally, and they taper to have less and less mass as we get more distal. That is in large part to reduce the amount of rotational inertia. Um, so the mass of the limbs is greater at the proximal ends and taper distally to reduce the rotational inertia. Um, because it means that we have more of our mass and our center of mass more proximal, closer to each of the axes of rotation at each joint. Uh, so that means we're going to have less rotational inertia, which means that when applying the same amount of torque, we can have more angular acceleration. Or put the other way, we can have the same amount of angular acceleration by using less torque because the mass is closer to our um, axis of rotation. So we often manipulate the shape of our body to reduce the rotational inertia to make movement easier so that we don't need to use as much muscle force to produce as much torque. Um, so like an example of that is, let's say you lay flat on your back and you've got your legs extended and you're lowering, you're hinging at the hip and lowering the legs to the floor and lifting up again with straight legs. That's a lot harder than if you're laying flat on the floor and you bend your knees in 
you know, you flex your knees as you flex your hips and bring your knees up to your chest and then extend out to the ground and flex the knees. So the reason it's so much easier when you bend your knees to bring into your body is because as you do that, you're keeping the center of mass of those limbs closer to the axis of rotation, which in this case is the hips. So you're reducing the rotational inertia of the entire limb, which means that your muscles don't need to produce as much force to generate as much torque to be able to move those limbs. Whereas when you keep the legs totally extended and you're just lifting up and flexing the hips, the rotational inertia is greater because the center of mass of the limbs is further away from the axis of rotation, which is the hip, as you're going all the way up and down through that movement. That requires greater force production to apply enough torque to be able to move um, those limbs through space. Okay, so rotational work is exactly the same as linear motion work. Um, so it's the angular displacement instead of linear displacement of an object around an axis due to the application of torque. Okay, so the angular work is just the angular torque, or the torque is, I should say, um, that's applied times the change in position. Okay, so it's the angular displacement caused by the applied force times the torque. Now, basically everything else we do in this class is all done in degrees. So all of your calculations, all of your formulas, we always stay in degrees in this class. Um, this is, I think, the only exception to that where to um, put your angle or your change in um, displacement um, into this formula, it needs to be converted into radians. So like if you're solving a problem, I'll either give it to you in radians or I'll, you'll have the opportunity to convert it into radians. You don't need to know the formulas and how to do that yourself. Um, so you don't need to worry about that, but this is like the only scenario where you do need to use radians instead of degrees. Everything else stay in degrees. Okay, so rotational power, um, again, exactly like linear motion, it's the rate of performing work, just in this case, angular work instead of linear work. Um, so power is just the torque uh, times the angular velocity, and we get the rotational power. All right, so that is all I have for you. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you for the next one.